Okay, thanks. So it's my pleasure to start the second day of this open force field meeting. I will talk in the next 45 minutes about electrostatics. So uh, just briefly introduce myself. So I'm Michael Schaupel. I'm here in the Gilson lab uh, in San Diego. And I'm here on a fellowship from the Austrian Science Fund. And in that fellowship, I propose to work on polarizable force fields. And that's why I'm working on polarization. And I did that for the first couple of months. And then we found out that actually a lot of the things I'm doing for the polarizable force fields are also useful for fixed charge models. That's why I'm also involved in that part of the open force field effort. And that's the reason why I'm here today and present to you the ideas for our charge models. So I want to start off with a slide you already saw yesterday. And it's the general overview slide, just to give you an idea where we are. So we are now uh, defining our force field, so setting what kind of parameters we have and what kind of parameters we want to optimize in our optimizer. So now a bit more detailed, what I will cover in this talk. So I will first talk about fixed charge models in Smirnov and our plans for implementing new fixed charge models. There is like our uh, short-term goal, a new version of RESP, which we call RESP2. Afterwards, Sue from Leaping's lab will briefly introduce uh, the RESPide program, and then I will continue on with uh, how we want to come up with a new uh, generation of AM1 BCCs. And in the second part, then I will talk about polarizable charge models, where we also have a short-term solution based on RESP and one solution based on AM1 BCC. So, as I said, I want to start off with the fixed charge models. And uh, to do that, I would just want to give you a brief overview of what's the current status of uh, fixed charge models. So, as Smirnov is somehow a sibling of GAF, you can run them with the same charge models as uh, GAF, so RESP and AM1 BCCs. And we usually use for our calculations mainly AM1 BCC up to now. Uh, with the new or generation of Smirnov, we also want to have new and better charge models. And one idea is based on RESP, so that should be a new implementation of RESP. And the other thing is a new generation of AM1 BCCs. So I want to start off with uh, the RESP based approach. To do that, I want to briefly uh, summarize the idea of RESP. Uh, so the idea is we are using a gas phase QM calculation at a quite low level, so Hardy-Fox 631G star. And then we calculate the electrostatic potential around uh, a molecule, and then we fit charges which are reproducing the electrostatic potential. And the nice thing is that actually harder fog with that low basis set is somehow overpolarizing the gas phase so that we can use those charges uh, for condensed phase simulations. Um, that's actually just a lucky error compensation and not really um, very well defined. So probably we can come up with a scheme which covers polarization better than uh, this approach. And uh, why we are not using higher, just higher level QM calculations? The problem is if we are doing that and do that in gas phase, uh, we end up with charges which are too low. So we are not accounting for the polarization in condensed phase. And if we are running an implicit solvent calculation, so the same molecule just with implicit solvent and use the dialectic constant of water, we end up with charges which are too high. Uh, because we do not account for something like polarization costs or so. Um, so what can we do when we have one charge set that's too, too low and the other one is too high? We can uh, mix them together. And our idea for RESP2 is uh, that we are using two high-level QM calculations. So one is based on uh, is a gas phase calculation, one is an implicit solvent calculation. Then we are doing two individual RESP fits. And then we mix those two charge sets together uh, based on a mixing parameter. So we are taking a fraction delta from the gas phase charges and a fraction one minus delta of the implicit solvent calculations. 
And all that should then be implemented in, within RESPIPE in the near future. I want to uh, talk about two main things now. First, I want to talk what kind of QM uh, calculation we want to use. And the other thing is I want to talk about the mixing parameter delta and how we can fit this uh, mixing parameter. I will start off with uh, what would be nice or what kind of QM level we want to use. So it would be nice if we could just use a very good method, method like CCSTD. Uh, unfortunately, that's pretty expensive and we don't want to do that. Um, but luckily, uh, a lot of people studied CCSD calculations for small molecules and they uh, compared other functional forms or other QM methods to the CCSD result, and they found out that for at least for electronic properties, double hybrids are also quite accurate. Double hybrids are still uh, quite expensive, and we don't want to use them for uh, drug like molecules or to parameterize a lot of molecules. So we are just using this double hybrid as our gold standard and compare what kind of cheaper functional is still good and is somehow. Uh, uh, agrees with the double hybrid calculations. And to do that, we tested different functionals and different basis sets uh, on a test set of 71 molecules and then compared the arrows to the double hybrid uh, calculations. And you see here on the left side just what kind of molecules we included in our test set. Um, we then did all those calculations and first calculate the molecular dipole moment. And what we saw is, okay, if we compare to double hybrids, uh, Harder Fock is uh, doing not a really good job, so the errors are quite high. And for MP2 and um, the free tested functionals, we are doing more or less uh, similar. So it seems that uh, they're the DFT functions are similar in the currency than MP2. Yes. Um, that's the first property we calculated. The other thing is we actually want to use uh, the electrostatics potentials uh, for fitting charges. So we compared how the ASPs are doing. Again, Hard Refoc is doing not a great job. Uh, MP2 is actually quite good as long as we're using a high enough basis set. And actually, the function is doing only slightly worse than MP2, but are uh, much cheaper. And it seems that when we compare the result of both um, uh, properties and also account how we want to, how the speed of the method is, we think that with uh, something like a BW6, B95 with our augmented double uh, CETA basis set, we can get quite good performances. Uh, the double hybrid ESP was rough. Yeah, uh, so the reference was uh, double hybrid, uh, this uh, PBP86 uh, with a quadruple set uh, basis set. Probably that the uh, people from Zoom can also hear what you asked. Are you doing a norm over all ESP grid points? Uh, yes. Okay, okay, I understand, thank you. And I'm using uh, a Mertz Coleman thing uh, kind surface. Um, yeah, that was, was what I want to tell you about the, the QM method. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, the mixing parameter delta. So we want to use as a starting value 0.5. Uh, there is some physical justification to use 0.5, and it's also the IPOL Q approach. But we will just use that as a starting value and then uh, co-optimize this uh, mixing parameter together with the Leonard-Jones parameters using Leaping's force balance and all the experimental data we can access through the property calculator. And the nice thing with that uh, parameter is that we are only introducing one additional parameter in the optimization, but we can use that parameter to tune the polarity of our force field. And that's uh, quite a nice idea, we think. Um, to sum up this uh, REST2 approach, I just want to highlight the pros and cons about it. So we think that we should be able to describe the ESP better due to the higher level of QM. We have that nice parameter to fit the, the polarity against condensed phase experimental data. 
and uh, we should be able to capture the polarizabilities of molecule more accurate because we are not re relying on the error compensation of hardware Fox 631G. Uh, the downside is if we are using that new charge model with the current Leonard Jones parameters, we probably don't get better results, so we have to refit them. Uh, but we should be able to do that uh, within the open frost field effort. And the other thing is uh, the higher level QM calculations are more expensive. And I will talk about how we can uh, tackle this uh, problem that they are comput computational a bit more demanding in a few minutes. Um, Yes, John? You do? Oh. Yeah. 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 Uh, d this is really cool stuff. Uh, d does the delta have to be a constant for all molecules? Could you learn some sort of representation that maps individual molecules to individual deltas based upon functional groups or something like that? That's a good question. Michael, uh, I want to say you, this is something you already mentioned. <laughs> okay. um, um, actually, um, at least at the beginning, I think it is nice to tune just one to get us in the right starting point. And the problem is if you have different deltas for different functional groups, when you have then a molecule with two different functional groups, how do you combine them? So I think we can talk about a bit later when I explained what our plans for the BCCs are, and uh, you see where we can probably individual tune. Uh, the for the electrostatics. If I could just yeah. follow up on that, I think again, like we yeah. talked about, that if you have to points to different functional groups, you won't maintain uh, the charge of the molecule without imposing another constraint. But yeah, yeah why not? It's yeah. Kind of so uh, it should be so, is it? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, I I understand how you figured out your uh, your vacuum side of the calculation, but I I think I missed how you were doing the uh, condensed phase component. Like you're mixing the condensed phase as well. Did you mention how you were doing the condensed phase calculation? The, the condensed phase should be just an implicit solvent calculation with a uh, dielectric constant of eighty. Okay, and and which uh, di which. Uh, dielectric method are you using? Um, we still have to test what fits our needs best. Okay. Maybe you have strong opinions on that? Invariably. <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to briefly mention uh, our estimated timeline for this part of the project. So we are currently deciding what QM methods we want to use, so what should be our reference, and also what kind of implicit solvent model we want to use. Then we want to test our, to get a baseline how good our charge model does without refitting uh, the mixing parameter and the Leonard Jones parameters. And within the end of the year, we hope that we can uh, refit Leonard Jones and mixing parameters and hopefully implement that within a year. And then we want to improve that charge model until uh, the end of the open force field effort. And if I've, yeah, now it's time for Sue, who is presenting Leaping's uh, RESPite approach because it fits better into the RESP uh, stuff. <laughs> Is this work? Working? Yeah, I think it works. Yeah. Cool. So, so the REST method and the AM1BCC are considered to be the standard method for atomic po atomic partial charge calculations, but the existing tools are not interoperable with other software tools or not open enough. So our main concepts are implementation of open source version of RESP method in Python and adding new features to improve our current charge models. So I'm initially focused on reproducing the previous result. 
And uh, the package we encoded is called Respite. And these are major features of Respite package. Um, user can set the restraints for the fittings and they can fit charges for multiple molecules and multiple conformers at the same time. And also they can se select which kind of, which um, grid selection schemes they, they are going to use. And also they can set the flex flexible constraint on charges. For example, they can uh, for symmetry on residues or across the residues. So this is data, data flow chart for, uh, of the package. They have two parts. One is ESP generators and the, the not, another one is RESP optimizer. So if we input the uh, coordinates of molecules and the conformers with a setting for a molecule in, uh, with the input files containing molecule information and grid settings, uh, ESP generator can take the inputs and generate the molecule object, and they generate the ESP um, grid points around the molecules, and they run cipher calculation to calculate the electrostatic potential and electric field on each grid point. And then they, gen they generate the ESP data, which has an appropriate directory structures for the RESP optimizer, and the RESP optimizer takes the ESP data as an input and with the input file containing the models and constraints user are gonna use, uh, they can generate the fitted charges for each molecules. So using the Respite package, we did, uh, we did some comparison between, a uh, comparison of performance between different charge models. And these are preliminary results we got. So, um, for the comparison of the performance between the different charge models, uh, there are several ways we can try. One is the re uh, one is the rendering of residuals between the QM ESP and the MM ESP uh, based on the fitted charges, and to uh, check if we can uh, reproduce the figures in the Christopher's 1993 paper. We, uh, we re-rendered the residuals around the methanol molecules from the different charge fitting method. Uh, so if you see these figures, uh, the <coughs> colors of the each spheres are the values of uh, values of the ESP point on each grid points, and the radius means the magnitude of the residuals. So if you see the like white big spheres on the upper right figures, that means there's a large residuals on the non-polar areas. So uh, by rendering these figures, we can compare between different charge models. And um, the, if you see the upper left, UNFR is the unrestrained fitting with, uh, with no force symmetries and the UNAP means the unrestrained fitting with uh, averaging charges after fittings, and UNEQ means the unrestrained fitting with forced symmetries, and WK.FRSTEQ is the um, standard two-stage fit method we, um, people usually use. So you, you can see the uh, two-stage fit can um, improve the improve the charge uh, fitting uh, results, especially around the polar areas when you compare the two-stage fitting figures with the on uh, un dot eq. <coughs> and also, we can calculate the relative solvation energy differences between uh, two different set of charges. Um, to compare the performance between different charge models. And uh, we, uh, just for the simplicity of the notation, I just used RESP2, RESP1, 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 and RESP2. And RESP2 means the two-stage fit to electrostatic potentials, and RESP1 means single-stage fitting 
and REF1 means single stage fitting to electric field. So when we try to calculate the relative solvation energy differences on methanol molecule, um, you can see the table. And uh, when we switch from the two-stage fit restrained electrostatic potential to uh, the single-stage electric field electric fit electric field fitting, uh, the relative solvation energy differences was smaller than the one from one. The, one, the red one uh, from the single stage RESP fitting. Also, oh, REF2 means the two stage restrained electrostatic potential fit. I just, um, yeah. Oh, REF2, oh, sorry. REF2 means the two stage fit to electric field. So, from this calculation, we could. Um, we could check that this could lead to the lead to a simplification in how we derive RESP charges. And also we conducted some relative MM energies between conformers and compare them with different charge models. Um, and if you see the uh, left figures, that's the uh, that's the charge to charge comparison and the uh, Black line is the charges from the two-stage rest fitting, and the red dots are from the single-stage rest fitting uh, fitting method, and the blue dots are from the single-stage uh, electric field fitting. And you can see that you can see, uh, these are from the two, uh, 26 dipeptides with five conformers each, and from these figures we could see the. Um, electric fields fitting lower than nonpolar charges with only with single stage fitting compared to the single stage fit, uh, a single stage electrostatic potential fit. So uh, these are, so far, uh, these are our preliminary results for the calculations and we are going to do, we are going to like focus on the another larger sets of molecules to see to compare the performance between charges thanks so i'll, I'll now continue again uh with uh or I told you before, Sue talked about respite that I want to talk about uh, that uh, resp is a bit more computational demanding and how we can come up with a solution for that. And actually, uh, uh, a few years ago, also Hardware Fuck was quite expensive. And then Chris Bailey came up with uh, the great idea of AM1 BCCs. And we want to do like a new version of AM1 BCCs to reduce the costs uh, of resp too. And to do that, I just want to briefly start with uh, explaining what are AM1BCC or what is AM1BCC. And the idea is, uh, sure. yeah, sure. Thanks. So, yeah, so I'd be interested to know the how much of the cost difference between using AM1BCC and using uh, quantum approaches, what, what that cost difference actually is and how much that really impacts people. Because I know in the AMBA community, a lot of people use AM1BCC purely because it's automated, not because it's cheaper, right? So you can use antechamber, you can tell it use AM1BCC, it's a single command line and it just runs. The, the, if you want to use QM, you have to put in the QM package and it's a manual process so people don't do it, right? If that, I feel like if that was automated, the, the cost of the QM part wouldn't I mean compared to the cost of actually doing the simulations later, it still seems trivial. But. I mean that's true now, but probably I don't know. AM1 BCC was developed 15 years ago, and 15 years ago it was still an oh, issue. Yeah, that's when it, then then it was. I mean no, the yeah. reasons it was done made sense at the time. Yeah. I'm just wondering are yeah. are those reasons still valid today? Yeah. Uh, probably not for Hardware Fox 631G, but if you're going to a higher level QM calculation, which is more expensive, then probably those uh, facts uh, play a role. Yeah, I just think yeah. we get to quantify that. That's yeah. Yeah. 
within a set. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which has advantages in and of itself. I think this is true, though, only if you're talking about simulations, not if we're talking about something like conformational searches where a small molecule needs yeah. to be minimized in seconds. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say something along the same lines. Like, you know, if, you're, if your main application is free energy calculations or something, then sure, you can just do a full QM. But maybe maybe you're going to be do doing docking or confirmational searches. And so you need something that's a fraction of a second per molecule. So, so we are going to need a fast method anyway, even though for free energy calculations, you might not. So I, I guess very quickly. So, so we've always had the option of doing QM or AM on BCC, right? Uh, is it, is now not the time to standardize completely? And then fit all of the parameters based on that single choice of electro in that there will be error cancellation right? rather than we have kind of a fast method and a and a accurate method. Yeah, I'm wondering. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I'm wondering if that would be. I think we'll discuss electrostatics this afternoon, and that's a broad enough question. I'm wondering if we should raise it then. Another possibility is to have, uh, we've always talked about using the same input data to train multiple like expense, ex different expenses of force fields. So one could have a very expensive force field where you have to do some sort of high quality RESP like electrostatics with high quality QM uh, that would be maybe more useful for individual free energy calculations. And then there could also be a very fast version for A1 BCC trained with the same data and maybe with slight accuracy differences. So there could be two different forms of the same force field that are supposed to be consistent. Uh, hi, this is Thomas. Uh, just uh, a question. Um, when you talk about REST versus PCC, is there any any good study that shows the superiority of one of them over the other, or is just you get numbers with uh, with a REST uh, REST charges, you get another number with PCC charges, but in the end, does it really make a difference? I think I think I can partly answer that, and I think the answer is that. Because of um, a wizard who's in this room, M1BCC is in some cases slightly better than RESP and at least not usually much worse. Um, but that's because of the wizardry in part. So, so yeah, I was going to say, keep in mind though that the dihedral parameters are a function of the charges you yeah, use, yeah. right? So if, if the dihedral parameters were fit to AM1BCC and then you use a high level QM, method yep. without refitting the dihedrals you 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 may not get as yeah, good so results, so. i think the am in amber you know family we sort of treated partial charges as swappable which we are not allowed to do but we do it anyway and so this is part of our opportunity to kind of fix that in the way that john just described another so, sorry yeah i was gonna mike you want to go really quick we should probably get back to the talk and, and save some of this for the breakout but yeah uh well, I guess I'll indulge myself or whatever, but I mean, I guess another thing is that the BCCs give you a set of handles to tune against empirical data that the RESP doesn't immediately do aside from the delta that Michael was suggesting. Yeah, I will tell you how we want to deal with or where we see advantages using BCCs uh, for the parameterization. Um, uh, something else, I, I just looked a lot of different charges in the last few months, and it seems that uh, sometimes RESP charges are a bit odd and BCCs are a bit more consistent. So that's just my impression. Um, but I want to follow up. So what the basic idea of AM1 BCC is, so you use a very cheap method like AM1 in that case and then you get an initial set of rough charges and then you somehow correct those uh, charges with uh, bond charge corrections and bond charge corrections are nothing else than you allow to transfer electrons from one atom forming a bond to the other atom so i'm reducing uh, the charge on one atom forming a bond and adding the same amount of charge on the other atom and uh, how much uh, electrons i'm moving is stored in the force field file uh, which uh, where we have the BCCs parameterized. Um, ah, sorry. Yeah, this um, this kind of just a this is a pretty dumb question. Can you give a can you give an order of magnitude estimate on how large the BCCs are? Are they around 0 0.1 or 0 0.3 or as large as one? Probably Chris Bailey knows that by heart. <laughs> um, 
so, um, and the answer is some are big and some are small, but they're uh, generally, I would say, on the order of, if you looked at the distribution, I'd say a lot of them are uh, uh, less than 0.1, but then there are a few really important ones that are probably between 0.1 and 0.2. And I'm trying to remember, there could be, no, I'd say most of them fall within that range. Actually, I'm online. Can, can someone repeat that question? Uh, uh, Li Ping asked uh, what the magnitude of the BCCs was. And Chris Bailey answered that they were mainly in the range of 0.1 with a few outliers where the BCCs were higher. To sum up the discussion. Um, so uh, why do we now think that we can train a new version of BCC? So the first thing is BC AM1 BCC was trained uh, to reproduce RESP uh, calculations, so the hardware fuck calculations. So we are now using new potentials for RESP, so we can also train new BCC models uh, on that uh, new uh, ESP potentials. Uh, the other thing is that we think that the Smirnov uh, representation of force fields gives us a great framework to define the BCCs and that we can more easily see where we can combine BCCs and where we have to add additional BCCs. The other thing is that we can improve the training set, the, so the QM training set, and we want to do that by looking at uh, databases and pull out uh, frequently occurring substituents and there were also from industries uh, the request to include a lot of heteram aromatics and we know also where uh, AM1 BCC has its deficiencies so we would like to include boron data and phosphor and sulfurs more extensively and Chris Bailey did it to a small extent for the AM1 BCC to include experimental reference data, and we want to include much more experimental data, and that should be one of the main advantages of the new generation of AM1 BCCs. And you see, I put the AM1 uh, in parentheses because actually we want to probably replace AM1 with another method just to reduce the magnitude of the BCCs. So if we are already with our fast method quite close uh, uh, to the uh, target charges, we can really use the BCCs to fine tune our charge model. And that would be uh, uh, an advantage in our opinion. And uh, what goes in hand with that is the charge population method. So we probably want, don't want to use Mollican charges anymore. So probably want to reduce that with something else, like for example, Hirschfeld charges. As those calculations are quite cheap, we can probably test a lot of different combinations here. Um, so, yes. We have another question. Yeah. You mentioned uh, a different QM method. Which ones did you have in mind? Um, so, of course, there's AM1 probably with a lived in charges or everything, uh, anything else, other semi-empirical methods or even a cheap hard to fuck calculation would be something we could do. And probably we also want to do a rest fit for the cheap calculations. We will see. So. I'll just mention one of our infrastructure issues is that there's not really good, uh, fully open, easily Conda installable AM1 implementations around. So if we were able to find something that was in Sci4, for example, yeah. that was a cheap hard refoc, that could be, from an infrastructure perspective, much better because then we could easily build on it and it would be fast. Yeah. yeah. So as I said, we will test something and probably if we really think that something which is not already implemented in Sci4, probably we can get it implemented if we really think it's much better than anything else. And otherwise, we will stick with the things we have implemented in the open source packages. So uh, actually, for to parameterize a molecule, not a lot of things should change. So you still run a low-level calculation, which is probably not AM1 anymore, any other cheap uh, QM method. And then you look up, again, the BCCs in a force field file. And this is a new set of PCC, so with different values. And then you should end up with quite decent forceful charges. And how do we want to train those PCCs? So the starting point is fit them to the electrostatic potential 
uh, of RESP2. So taking a fraction of the guest phase uh, ESP and a fraction of the uh, implicit solvent the ESP and then uh, solve that equation so that we reduce uh, the error in the ESP reproduction from the charges. And then we should get an initial set of BCCs. And then we want to uh, use those BCCs and uh, include a lot of experimental training data. So fit those BCCs or, or optimize those BCCs together with Leonard Jones parameters. And there, the question from John Codera from previous comes in, in play. So here we think we can tune individual groups. So we can tune individual BCCs, and that should give us more flexibility for uh, uh, tuning uh, to experimental training data. And again, that should be implemented with property with the property calculator, uh, calculator and uh, force balance. So to also give you an estimated timeline for this part of our project, so we somehow rely on the, the REST2 potential, so we have to uh, define them first, and then we want to parameterize different flavors of AM1 BCCs. So AM1 is probably replaced with some other uh, QM uh, method, and then we see which, gives, uh, uh, which method is closest to our target value, and probably we start with those values or that, that method. And then we are going and refitting only the a mixing parameter first and the Leonard Jones parameters to get us in a better starting position for then a, a fine tuning of BCCs together with Leonard Jones parameters. And we hope that we then implement that in Smyrna within the end of next year. That would be the plan. And then as more and more experimental data comes available, we should be able to improve the BCCs further and further. So something else I want to talk about fixed charges, uh, including off-center charges. So there was or there is the idea that we can improve much when we include off-center charges. And uh, most of the infrastructure is already in place. And we are doing or including off-center charges that should go parallel to the other effort. And only we have to implement, implement it still in the toolkit, but then it should be uh, this part of the project also starting. Um, that was all I want to talk about is fixed charge models. And I want to now uh, talk a bit about polarizable charge models. And to start off, I want to just briefly give an idea why we need explicit polarization. So uh, one reason, so there's probably a few other reasons is that when we have a molecule, and it, once it's in water, once it's a membrane, and even when it's going to a protein binding bucket, it's getting even more complicated. One set of charges is probably not representative for uh, all uh, electrostatic potential of uh, those molecules. So probably we can improve the description when we include polarization explicitly. Um, the problem of uh, polarizable force fields is that they are more expensive and uh, we are trying to making a polarizable force field or, and also a parameterization scheme, which is as uh, cheap as possible. So that's our idea. And that's what I want to explain to you in the next uh, uh, few minutes. Uh, yeah. Yes. You, you may cover it in the next few slides. Uh, but one thing that always comes up is uh, the hardware these days is very different to what it used to look like 20 years ago, right? So, so everything has to be naturally parallel. So something can be mathematically very expensive, but computationally very cheap, or it can be mathematically cheap, but computationally very expensive, right? Uh, yes. They don't map directly to each other. So I would say when we, you know, one, one of the things in the vote right now is it's not, it, the, the old days you used to be able to say, well, what's the best polarization model to use? within how much computing I can do, and that's what you choose. But these days, we need to pick polarization scheme that is inherently parallel, which means no kind of SCF cycles, if, if possible, right? Or uh, no, uh, essentially avoid any kind of iteration inside an inner loop. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering if you're keeping that in mind when we... Yeah, I will talk about it in a minute, what we have in, in mind for that. Okay. Probably you're the expert in really implementing it and you can yeah, comment. I wish I had time to implement stuff these days. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Sorry, I just have a quick question to the fixed charge model. You said um, you plan on finishing like end of next year, so 2020. We don't mean end of this year. Um, for So the idea is we have rest ready until the end of this year and AM1 BCC is probably implemented within the 2020 release of Smirnoff, whenever that release will be. So that would be the uh, idea or the plan up to now. Um, so again, I want to talk about do two different schemes to, to get uh, parameters for the electrostatics. One is again based on REST and extend REST with polarization and the other one is an extension of AM1 BCC with polarization. Um, again, want to start with what should it look like or how do we want to parameterize one molecule? So. Uh, to parameterize one molecule, we would have to run one guest phase QM calculation, uh, and then we solving something like a REST-like equation. And the equation is very similar to the REST equation. It, the only difference is the last term. So we are including the intramolecular polarization already. And we to do that, we need four field parameters for the polarizabilities. And our idea is that we pre-parameterize those polarizabilities. And two things I want to mention here is, first, all the data I show you in the following slides are based on MP2 calculations, but probably we switch to the same method as we are using for REST2. And the other thing I want to mention, how is we, or how do we obtain those polarizability parameters? There are different ways. One would be use experimental values, and the other way is QM-derived uh, polarizabilities and we are focusing on a QM-derived method. So just to give you uh, an idea of what I talk about in the next few slides, so we are fitting polarizabilities based on MP2 calculations with a triple seater basis set. We used a relatively small test set of 22 molecules, which could cover a subset of the chemical space. And uh, for every molecule, we used multiple confirmations and uh, for every confirmation, then we use seven single point calculations where we have one have the, the gas phase uh, calculation and six polarized version of the same confirmation. And then we propose a sequential fit of polarizabilities and charges. So we do in the first step only fit a uh, fit of the polarizabilities. So we fit the polarizabilities to the difference of a polarized and an unpolarized version of the same conformation and the same molecule. And then we should add up just with the effect of the external electric field. And uh, we then assign polarizability parameters or, uh, based on uh, Smirks patterns. And we find out that we actually only need very few parameters. So if we do uh, different difference creation between elements and hybridization states, we already quite uh, uh, good in agreement with the QM calculations. And then in the second step, uh, we do uh, the fit for the charges. And uh, the charge fit already include the uh, uh, preset polarizabilities, which were fitted in the first step. And we only fit them to the unpolarized molecule with the REST-like uh, equation I showed you uh, one slide before. Or if we are fitting uh, BCCs, it's an AM1 BCC like equation. So, and we did that sequential fit, and we also did a co optimization of charges and polarizabilities, and then we compared uh, the results. So, if we are co optimizing charges and polarizabilities, uh, we end up with an error of 4.11, which doesn't mean a lot. So, we uh, normalize that to 100% because that's the smallest error we can get with that uh, representation. And then we look at how good the sequential uh, approach does. And actually you see our error, our additional error is almost nothing. So we only have 1% additional error in reproducing DSP. Um, we did then a similar thing for BCC. So just to give you the idea, what would be the idea or how you are parameterizing a molecule with a polarizable version of BCC, you again, using one low-level QM calculation, and then you look at the BCCs and the polarizabilities uh, 
in a force field file. And again, you could fit the BCCs and the polarizabilities at the same time or fit them individually. And when you do that, you see when you're going from uh, individual charges to rough charges with BCC, you introduce an additional error of 60% in DSP. So that's similar to the error between RESP and AM1 BCC, but it's just DSP, so it doesn't really mean that it's worse for other uh, properties. And you see if we are going to uh, sequential uh, polarizabilities with BCCs, the additional error is 10%, so it's much less than uh, introducing or using BCCs. So it seems to be valid that we can use those uh, sequential optimized polarizabilities for both charge models. And the nice thing about that is that the polarizabilities are fitted before the charge model, so they have never seen the charge model. So this are uh, exactly the same polarizability parameters for both charge models. And we probably can come up with any other charge model and stick the polarizabilities on top of that, as long as we include the intramolecular polarization uh, during the fitting process of the charges. So you're looking at the error with respect to the electrostatic potential, yes. right? But th that condensed phase property errors might be totally different and we're missing things like nuclear quantum effects that, that may actually be relevant here and might need to be incorporated in an average way. So is there any real drawback to co-optimizing things like with the rest of the force field and Leonard Jones? Uh, the problem is when we are co-optimizing, uh, uh, okay, if we're co-optimizing charges and uh, polarizabilities, we need a lot of molecules to get the polarization polarizabilities right otherwise you have somehow ill-defined polarizability at least when you're only fitting the ESP so uh, you end up with uh, polarizability shifted for example from a carbon in the CH3 group to the hydrogen so it, you can end up with a negative polarizability on the carbon and you, uh, could, you could have positivity constraints but you're, you're only using elemental uh, typings right so, yes uh, more or less I don't I every, every individual atom of every individual molecule right just you have like 12 classes of, of polarizabilities and you're fitting to hundreds of different condensed phase properties as well. Yeah, the problem is when we're fitting uh, charges and uh, Leonard Jones uh, and polarizabilities, for charges we have a lot of parameters. So you have a lot of molecules and a lot of parameters because every charge is individual. If I may, um, I think um, I think I'm, I'm feeling you're actually going to address John's point because I think John is really asking about fitting to him condensed phase data. Oh yeah, I will talk about that in a minute. Okay, sorry. So, but it makes our life, when we are fitting only to the ESP, much easier because in the first step, we use a lot of molecules uh, to get the polarizabilities right. And then we can split it up uh, for the charges. And when for the charges, we have a lot of parameters, uh, but every molecule is separate. And co-optimization here means co-optimization of charges and polarizabilities. Yeah. Just for the, yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah, so we'll yeah. get to the... Yeah. Um, so, as I told you, we are looking forward to making a polarizable force field as efficient as possible. And that comes to the question from Ross. So, there is the way of uh, using a self-consistent field approach for calculating uh, uh, dipoles. And the idea of that is, charges are inducing an electric field and then you use that electric field to calculate dipoles and the dipoles again are inducing an electric field which are inducing dipoles and so you have to solve that in the self-consistent uh, field approach. Uh, then there is the direct approach which we favor and in the direct approach you only consider the electric field from the point charges and neglect the dipole-dipole interactions. And we think that the, at least the faster method, it is less accurate, uh, but we want to know where we are less accurate. And we for that, uh, looked at the few molecules and we saw that we only do worse for molecules uh, with aromatic rings. And uh, as we now know where this direct approach has its flaws or deficiencies, we can probably correct them uh, during the, the fitting process. Yes. Just go back one slide a second. Yes. So, do those two approaches, in, in the limit, the, the direct approach, you, you essentially repeat multiple times. Uh, like if you did 
multiple time steps, right? Does the direct approach approximate the self-consistent approach? In if at yeah at zero Kelvin when you need, like it, like I'm I'm trying to think if you optimize structure. No, you don't. But you don't go to the same thing. Right? No, because uh, you probably even if the structure is always the same, you always end up with the same uh, dipole, which probably induced the exact same dipole on the other, or right. and that you never account for that. Okay, and that and that and and it can't cancel completely, right? No. Sure. I think I understand what you're alluding to. For example, let's say in, in time step one, everything gets polarized by just the charges. Now you have those polarizations. In time step two, you could then say, well, everybody feels all those induced polarizations mm -hmm. as well as the charge polarization. So, so it sort of build up over time. I, well, you'd have a time lag. You'd have a time lag. I mean, I think, I think, it, went, I think it would be... It would be some non-equilibrium thing, right? Yeah. Maybe it's an interesting idea. I never thought about it, but yeah. it's something we could think. Of. I have a feeling it would mess up the distribution. But... Okay, so so we had this problem with uh, amoeba, uh, where the, essentially, um, if you didn't convert the dipoles all the way, or if you were using the the last set of dipoles, you would get this weird thing where the forces are no longer the gradient of the potential, and that causes all sorts of stat mech problems. So we don't, we don't want that, but we want something that it's a one-to-one -one mapping from the current configuration to a polarizability. But there's an intermediate as well. You've been following the work of uh, Bernie Brooks, for example, where they, from a single evaluation, they can extrapolate essentially 99% of all of the polarization and still have it be completely deterministic. So you don't need any iterative stuff at all. So there, there might be dial, a, like a dial between the two that you can make it just a bit more expensive, but still get almost all of that polarization. Um, as a, at least our initial plan is following the direct approach because it is much, as a, at least a bit faster than the self-consistent field approach, and we know where the problems are, so we think we can correct them. And it's not only that we can run them the simulations faster; it's also using us or helping us for the parameterization, as we can run the simulations faster. We can also generate more converged results for the benchmarking and the parameterization of our results. And the direct approach is also very much in the same spirit as AM1BCC, where you give up a bit of the currency for speed up. And that's a nice uh, analogon. Um, with that, I just want to briefly mention what other things we are planning on doing. So we are aware that we have to scale the polarizabilities from gas phase to condensed phase. Uh, and we want to do that. Uh, First, with one parameter, two experimental data, so against experimental data, and together with Leonard Jones parameters. And then in the second uh, step, we want to tune individual polarizabilities together with the Leonard Jones parameters, but the first step is probably necessary to get us to a, a more suitable starting point. And then as soon as we improve the fixed charge model, like when we include off-center charges, we also want to do that. Uh, for the polarizable force field. And with that, I also want to briefly mention the timeline for this project. So again, this first point is the same thing. And then uh, we uh, want to parameterize this independent uh, set of polarizabilities. And then we start off with fitting uh, one scaling parameters and the current Leonard, uh, with the current Leonard Jones parameters. Then we are doing uh, uh, the co-optimization uh, co of the scaling parameters with uh, the Leonard Jones parameters. And then we assume we are running in a lot of troubles and uh, have to do a lot of testing. And probably a realistic goal is that we implement that 2021, or that would be the ideal case. And with that, I just want to thank the, the whole electrostatics group who is always discussing all those issues and the, the Gilson lab and the people involved in the Gilson lab in the open force field effort and the infrastructure group for implementing the off-center charges soon and uh, all other members for the, of the open force fields and the funding agencies for funding my stay here at UCSD. Maybe, uh, well, um, okay. well, maybe we'll get you hooked up and you can just maybe try to answer more questions. Yeah, so, uh, yeah.
I just want to make a, a quick comment that um, uh, with RESP and AM1BCC having been around for such a long time, I'm just so happy to see these models being actively worked on in the laboratories of uh, Li Ping and Mike Yeltsin, and I'm really super excited about this work. Having this uh, direct polarization model, which is um, uh, uh, having charge model independent polarizabilities is just, uh, I think, super exciting and very much in the spirit of this, uh, of the open force field network. But just thinking about that talk, one flavor at the end of it may, may have been a bit of what we were doing all the charge models, which maybe sort of is true. But I think part of the spirit of this initiative is there's going to be a lot of science that allows us to explore, which is some of what Michael talked about it. And then some of that will end up becoming different families of force fields down the line. And so you're getting sort of a flavor of that where it might be headed. And so some of that will be sort of the core fixed charge force field that a lot of us are, are most immediately focused on, but then there'll be these, these other directions as well. Any other last, last questions before we go on? Yeah, I have a question online. Yeah. Hi, this is Dory from Bristol Myers. So thanks for that talk. Um, I just kind of wanted to make the point that I, I know that obviously this is a really difficult problem um, but I do have some concerns when people talk about co-optimizing the charge parameters alongside the Leonard Jones, because I feel like one thing that would be great to be able to keep is to be able to physically understand what different energetic contributions are coming from, whether it's electrostatics um, or you know dispersion or polarization. And when we fit the things together, I'm afraid that that those distinctions might not be accurate anymore. I want to briefly comment on that. So that's the idea of uh, having only one parameter, which is fitting only the polarity of the, the force fields. So if we only have one parameter, we are not messing completely the, the whole physical sense of it. So that's at least one reason I think it is, or... If we, I agree that if we're fitting all the charges and all the Leonard Jones parameters, we probably overfit the whole problem and end up with uh, something which is not has nothing to do with the physics anymore. Another thing is that in reality, the um, the radius part of the Leonard Jones does affect the electrostatic massively, because it determines how the charges can get to each other. One of the things that I've sort of come to tentatively as an issue with all this dense phase fitting. And the radii right to get the density to it. But then when you're fooling with the radii, you're also messing up with the electrostatics. So I feel that it may actually be important to have a bit of a dial on the charges in order to both get densities right and cohesion at the same time. Well, we'll see, because now we're going to, we have force balance to play with now, so we can find out. Okay, so since she's not saying anything, I think she was happy with the answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, let me try that again. That's why I shouldn't say anything. Uh, what I was just saying is that one of the things that we've come to, oh, the, the, basically the, the, the radius part, this, the repulsive part of the Leonard Jones potential does affect electrostatics because it determines how close charges can get to each other. And one of the impressions I've developed hacking around with force fields using force balance in our, in our lab, this is work of Sam Kenton, and is that um, the density is are largely determined by the radii, by the essentially sigma. Um, but then you roll, those are also determining the electrostatics. And if we want to be able to independently tune densities and cohesion energies, we probably need to have a dial not only on sigma, but also on the level of polarity in some way. Yeah, and I think also I would add that in a way, they already are sort of partly co-optimized. I mean, so, okay, we didn't fit, at least we didn't, we didn't fit the electrostatics to condensed phase properties in the amber family of force fields, but um, the Leonard Jones have been optimized a lot based on things like densities and so on. And, and the BCCs in AM1 BCC, one reason why it's sometimes better than RESP is because those take into account some aspects of condensed phase properties to a limited extent. And 
and in fact, these initial optimizations in many cases were under constrained, which is what we found when we went back to look at dielectric constants, that you can make dielectric constants better by tweaking Leonard Jones and electrostatics parameters without impacting densities and heat of vaporization because the original optimization was under constrained. So, so they are coupled and I don't, yeah, and we can make force fields better by carefully working through that. And I don't think when we talk about co-optimizing them, that means we want to throw out all the physics or anything. I think we want to just do it carefully in a way that adds some additional data to constrain the optimization. 